The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Depending on where you're logging in from today, one of those will sound just about right. Um, welcome back to another great episode of our Best Practices webinar series with 7Signal. Um, I see a lot of you dropping in early. As always, thank you for doing that. Um, if you'd like to, let us know where you're logging in from today. If you are working remotely from home in your home office, if you are um, in the office today, I'm actually back in our Cleveland headquarters office, of course. And I am joined yet again by Jim Vada today in Cincinnati. How are you today, Jim? Great, Kelsey. Awesome. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Jim and I were joking earlier. We both looked like sports commentators because I finally graduated to the larger headphones. So doing yes. good today. I'm feeling feeling great. In the spirit of March Madness, we're doing a yes. Dick Vital impression here. Exactly. Yes. Awesome. All right. I see a lot of you dropping in here. I see Ron from St. Louis. Thank you for joining us today, Ron. Um, I see Morgan from Pittsburgh. Thank you for joining us today. I see Nick from Philadelphia. Thank you, Nick, for joining us in the office. Um, who else do we have? We have Tom joining us from Cleveland. Welcome, Tom. We have Olivier joining us again from Vancouver. Thanks so much. And I see a few more of you dropping in here, so please continue to do so. And we'll check in with you later as we get started here. So we are 7Signal, the leader in wireless experience monitoring. And before we begin, we will go a little bit more into depth as to what our mission is as 7Signal and what that means. So we have a great topic here today, the basics of 802.11 arbitration. And as I said, we are joined by Jim Vada, our chief wireless officer here at 7Signal to go through this. And Jim, when was the last time that we covered this topic? I believe a few months ago, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah we, um, uh, I think we did this in November. Perfect. So good, good time to update on it. Awesome. Really excited to dive in today. And as always, I'm Kelsey Rizzuto, the marketing specialist here at 7Signal. And we'll go ahead and get started here. So a couple of announcements, um, just bear with me here. We do partner with CWNP for every single one of our webinars. So if you're pursuing a certification um, by attending today, you are eligible for CE credits. So if you would like that and you're interested, just drop us a note and we can easily send that over to you via email. We also host a product tour every single Friday at 12 noon Eastern. Um, so you can go ahead and register at that link, go.7signal.com slash tour. And hopefully we'll see you later this week to dive through that. A great announcement here. Congratulations to our newest 7Signal certified wireless engineers. And we have a large list this time. So congratulations to you all. I'll go through here quickly. We have Dave Flynn, Philip McClure, Juan Gutierrez, Ashley Mead, Jacob Creed, Ashley Blick, Paul Smith, Phil Matthews, Daniel Tarbuck, Fabian Clark, Laura Hicks, Jenna Schaff, Mitchell Quarter, and Gordon Montgomery. Congratulations to all of you. Really excited for you all. Um, and thanks for being here. We also host or we also send out a newsletter every other week as well, the Troubleshooter newsletter from 7Signal. So if you aren't currently receiving that and would like to, we'll go ahead and drop a link here in the chat for you to get on our distribution list. We also post all of our slides from every webinar to our Twitter account. Uh, so those will be available later this afternoon. So if you're on there, go ahead and give us a follow at 7Signal. But if you aren't on Twitter, no problem. All of you today will be receiving a follow-up email with the recording and the presentation slides as well. And speaking of recordings, we do post all of our previous topics to our YouTube channel. So you can go ahead and watch some of our archived webinars from the past there. And today's presentation will be up there later this afternoon as well. One last announcement here. We also have a very exciting webinar topic coming up um, at the end of this month in a couple weeks here. How the post-pandemic era will change remote working with special guest Jeremy White, um, executive editor at Wired. So I know some of you have already registered for this webinar coming up, but we'll go ahead and drop the link in here as well so you can register early. 
All right, a little history on Seven Signal. We were established in 2007 in Helsinki, Finland, and we're now located in Cleveland, Ohio. We're really proud of all the major milestones we've hit along the way, such as our 1 billion data points that we're analyzing daily, in addition to the 5 million devices that we're monitoring daily as well. We have over 200 customers, over 30 partners, and 15 patents, which goes to show that the technology you see from Seven Signal, you're only going to see from Seven Signal. So to give you a little background as to what makes us so different, if you look at your typical enterprise LAN infrastructure here on the right, you've got great tools and technologies already installed on the network, giving you really useful feedback and useful data, such as your Cisco, Aruba, Riverbed, AppNetta, and more. But we pick up where they leave off, moving into a different space. We'll start here with Mobileye. Mobileye gives you full visibility into the user experience and can be installed on the individual devices themselves, giving you that perspective from the outside in, on the edge of the network. So Mobileye can be installed on any mobile device, such as your laptops, your mobile phones, your zebra scanners, workstation on wheels, and more and it can be installed on any Mac OS, Linux, Android, or Windows device. But additionally, with Mobileye, we can get that perspective into your external home networks, which is really useful with a lot of us today working from home. Um, it's still mission critical to stay connected to your work regardless of where you're logging in from. Additionally, we have Sapphire Eye, which are the sensors for service level quality and RF visibility. And through this combination, you're really able to gain a full perspective as to what is occurring in your wireless network that you just can't find anywhere else. All right, thanks for letting me run through our history here. We're gonna launch a trivia question today before we pass it over to Jim though. And let's see how you all do on this. All right, Jim, can you see this question? Sure can. Okay, true or false, in Wi-Fi, the access point controls all traffic on the channel. Clients just do what they are told under the control of the AP. All right, I see a lot of you dropping in here. I'll give you a couple more seconds. And we're gonna go ahead and close these polls. All right, Jim, how did we do today? Very good, the correct answer is false. So that means most of the audience has a, a good basis of understanding to get into some of the technical details of how the distributed uh, uh, coordination of Wi-Fi actually works. Awesome. Well, thank you to all of you for participating. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass the controls over here to our Chief Wireless Officer, Jim Vada, so he can go ahead and get started. Okay. Bring up the slides. All right, so <clears throat> thank you, Kelsey. And real quick about me, I'm uh, Jim Vado, Chief Wireless Officer here at Seven Signal. I'm a CWNE and CCNP Enterprise. Uh, previous experience as a wireless network engineer in several different verticals. Uh, and you can follow me at the links uh, there for Twitter, uh, my blog, which is just about Wi-Fi, and my amateur radio call sign is Kilo Echo 8, Oscar Kilo Victor. You can find me on two meters uh, and 70 centimeters uh, here and there. Uh, but today's topic is 802.11 arbitration, and it's a really important topic. It's one of those central ideas that a lot of uh, understanding kind of revolves around. Um, it's, um, it's really, you know, you could call it the heart and soul of Wi-Fi, and that's how I kind of think about it. What uh, arbitration is, is a standardized protocol um, that's used to share the channel that the access points and clients are operating on. And we need that because we don't have a, uh, central uh, command of channel access. Channel access decisions are distributed. And the reason this is so important is because when we're designing Wi-Fi, it's very simple to get great coverage, to make a map look green with coverage. You don't even need to do site surveys to do that and just put up APs all over the place. But 
optimizing the arbitration process is what results in high uh, performance. And that's really what we need, especially with the application requirements, like we talked about last week that we have on Wi-Fi today, voice being so prominent and real-time applications being so much more prominent um, these days. So why do we need a, why, why do we even need an arbitration protocol? Uh, there's a few reasons. One is Wi-Fi operates in unlicensed spectrum and unlicensed spectrum is open to anyone. Other data protocols uh, besides Wi-Fi like Bluetooth and Zigbee and 802.15.4 and cellular protocols can use the same spectrum. There's interference in the spectrum that we can't do it, anything about from uh, microwave ovens and, and uh, other sources of interference we just have to live with. We also uh, don't have a centralized scheduling algorithm the way ce cellular technologies do. As you guys know from the trivia question, the uh, decision to transmit and access and use the channel is actually done independently by every client and access point that's operating on the channel. From, those, from that decision making, we have this emergent order that makes it look like there's centralized coordination, but there really isn't. And the big challenge here is the channel that we operate it on is half duplex. That means only one station can transmit at a time and uh, everyone else has to wait until that transmission is done before they can transmit. And just like using a walkie-talkie, when you're transmitting, you can't hear yourself. So you don't know if somebody else transmitted at the same time and, and your uh, message was corrupted. You actually don't know if the intended receiver um, heard your message unless they respond back and say, uh, you know, roger that or give an acknowledgement like we do in Wi-Fi. So there's a number of challenges and a number of characteristics that make um, our arbitration protocol so important uh, in Wi-Fi. If you have a background in networking before coming to wireless, you know, you're probably very familiar with how Ethernet works, although we often don't have to think about it too much. Um, but Ethernet almost always is operating in full duplex mode. Can do half duplex, but we usually consider that a problem we need to fix. Wi-Fi is always half duplex. We just have to, to live uh, with it that way. Ethernet also benefits from being able uh, to uh, receive and transmit onto the wire at the same time. So we can use um, carrier sense multiple access with collision detection to tell if if our um, Ethernet frame uh, made it out onto the wire uncorrupted, because we can he listen to it at the same time. We don't have that benefit in Wi-Fi, so we need to acknowledge the frames uh, from the receiving station. And we rarely ever think about collision domains in Ethernet anymore. Ethernet can handle a lot of um, Ethernet adapters all operating on the same wire, uh, but we don't do that anymore. We use switching. You know, back in the 90s, we used hubs and other technologies where uh, where collision domains we had to think about, but you know that's really inefficient. And, and switching is so much better. We we just use switching all the time and don't even think about uh, you know multiple uh, Ethernet adapters sharing a wire and how you know collisions building up and things like that. It's not even a thought anymore. In Wi-Fi, it's just, uh, it's just uh, you know, part of our reality, even today with the latest standards. And, the, you know, the way we break up collision domains in Ethernet, well, we just have separate switch ports, right? And each, each switch port has one uh, Ethernet adapter connected there's a single collision domain there. 
In Wi-Fi, the collision domain is actually the channel we're operating on. It's not the access point because you could have more than one access point on the same channel. And now they're, they're sharing those that same resource. It's, it's the channel and all the access points and all the clients operating on that channel share a collision domain as long as they're within range of each other. So to get an idea of um, how, how many collision domains we can use, if we're looking at the five gigahertz band, the most channels we can use are 25 if we're using that 20 megahertz channel width. So um, in, a, in a high density scenario where all the APs are, are not too distant from each other, we have 25, potentially 25 uh, collision domains we can take advantage of. As we increase the channel width to 40 megahertz, we cut that in half to 12. 80 megahertz only gives us six, and 160 megahertz only gives us two, uh, if you're lucky. Sometimes some of these DFS channels are unavailable, uh, and sometimes we choose not to use them. And if we don't use them, we've lost two thirds of the capacity here in the band. Um, so, uh, really makes a big difference in terms of overall net performance if we can use these DFS channels and take advantage of breaking up our collision domains even more. All right, so the, the protocol we use in Wi-Fi for arbitration is called the Enhanced Dis Distributed Coordination Access Protocol, EDCA, sometimes, called, sometimes pronounced EDCA. And it is the protocol that every station, a station is either an access point or a client, every station must use to make sure the channel is free or idle before it transmits. And this goes all the way back to 2005 with 802.11e, where the distributed coordination function was enhanced to support uh, four QoS queues. Uh, and that's this is still how we operate today. So uh, there's several stages we go through uh, with EDCA. It's kind of a um, uh, it's kind of a, a soup of acronyms, but we'll define each of these and and talk about them in depth. But the important thing to realize is we're going through several stages where we're just listening. The station is just listening before it transmits. And each one of these. Uh, we have to check off as as uh, passing a test, if you will. If if we get to one of these and we detect the channel is busy, then we sort of start all the way over. So we start with the clear channel assessment. That's our layer one check. Then we go at up to layer two and check our nav timer. If the nav timer is expired, we know that we, we're not expecting any other transmissions immediately. Then we wait an inner frame space and in just a, a, a period of time that we're just waiting, even though we've already been listening and we didn't hear anything, we decide to wait again. And then we wait again. That's the contention window, the random back off timer, uh, where we count down a, a pseudo random value before finally transmitting. And if at any point during those periods we're waiting, our clear channel assessment trips, then we start all the way over. So we're, we are doing the CCA kind of all the way through this process until we, until we transmit. So the clear channel assessment has two phases. And remember, this is a layer one check. So first is signal detect. And that's a little bit confusing because signal kind of sounds more like um, something not specific to Wi-Fi, but it really is a check to see if the um, if the radio can if the station can hear any 802.11 frames, specifically the preamble of those frames. Sometimes you'll see this called preamble detect. I actually prefer that term because it's it's very clear about what we're doing here. 
And this is a very, very sensitive check. We only need about four decibels of SNR to trip the signal detect um, threshold. Um, and you know, a point to make here is um, SNR and RSSI are not uniform, are not measured the same way between clients. They can have different radio sensitivities, certainly different antenna configurations. Even right next to each other, you, you might get different results uh, from different clients. And we also learn from the preamble um, the length uh, of the frame that's, that's uh, being transmitted. And an important point to make here is signal detect doesn't care about the RSSI of the frame it's receiving. As long as it hears a preamble, this check is going to trip. So a common misunderstanding is that the louder AP wins. If, if my neighbor is on the same channel, but their AP is at minus 85 dBm where I am, I, I'll just crank my power to the max and blow them out of the water. I, they, they're, they're, you won't hear anything except my AP and my clients. That's actually not true. As long as we're demodulating the frame and, and we can hear the preamble specifically, every station that hears that preamble will back off and wait to transmit um, almost no matter how quiet it is. It is 4 dB of S SNR is, is a very, very quiet um, transmission. Okay, so the next CCA phase is energy detect. Still at layer one, this is where the, the radio is just listening for energy, RF energy, not specifically checking to see if there is uh, a, a um, 802.11 modulated frame, but just checking to see if there is anything. So this would pick up Bluetooth and cellular and uh, Zigbee and so on. Uh, um, you know, those things that aren't Wi-Fi that are also uh, we're sharing the channel with. And this is far less sensitive than signal detect. Um, the standard says you need to be 20 dB better than your signal detect threshold for energy detect. So, um, you know, that could be maybe in the next 60s somewhere. You, you need a pretty solid um, uh, signal for this to get tripped. Um, so finally, we move up to layer two, and this is where this concept of the NAV timer, the network allocation vector timer comes into play. What happens is once we've started demodulating a frame, uh, we get past the phi header and we get into the MAC header. And in the MAC header is a field, which you can see in the packet capture now, uh, because the MAC header is, is uh, preserved when we're doing wireless packet captures. There's a field called the duration field, sometimes the duration um, slash AID field, because it's sometimes used to show the association ID. Um, and what it's describing um, in microseconds, which are one millionth of a second, is how much more time does do uh, stations that hear this frame need to back off? Because after the frame, as we know, becomes an inner frame space and then an ACK from the receiver. So if you've heard the nav timer, you actually have a much more precise understanding of when to expect contention to be available again. If all we've heard was the, the preamble, then we know how long the frame is, and we might um, start our contention window early um, during the inner frame space before the ACK comes. And really, we want to wait till after the ACK, and that's what the nav timer allows us to do. Finally, we get to the contention window, and this is where every station calculates a random back off timer. Uh, no, you know, normally uh, with one of, of 16 slot times, and a slot time is nine microseconds long. 
So the reason we need this is if we have multiple stations all contending for the channel at the same time, say a transmission just ended and everyone started con um, started going through this process, well, they'd all arrive without some, they're, they're all essentially synchronized in time. The random backup timer desynchronizes us, so hopefully uh, only one station wins access to the channel. Um, this is also, the contention window also doubles every time a frame is retried. So if we transmit and don't get an ACK, an acknowledgement back from the receiver, we have to retransmit that frame because we are assuming they didn't receive it. And when we retry uh, the transmission, we double the value of the contention window uh, all the way up to 1,024 slot times before giving up. So this is again a reason why we need to um, really focus on the efficiency in optimizing our arbitration process because when we're retrying, we're taking up more and more time on the channel and we don't want to do that. Um, this is also where QoS comes into the comes into play. This is what 80211 E added um, to DCF. The way we we apply QoS in Wi-Fi over the air is by altering the size of the contention window. So, for example, the voice queue. If you have a frame, the station has a frame and needs to transmit, and it's in the voice queue, the, the random backoff timer will only calculate a value between zero uh, and seven. So you're more likely to get channel access because your um, backoff timer is going to very likely be lower. But it's probabilistic. It's not deterministic. Um, most of the time, it actually works out. So if we've actually gone all the way through this process, through the contention window, our backoff timer has reached zero, we can finally move from just listening to, fi to finally transmitting. And just to give a, a view of what this looks like in the air um, and, and some of the fields involved in the, in the frames as they're transmitted, we're going to start with contention. This is the, the uh, EDCA process where we go through the CCA, we check our nav timer, we still wait in inner frame space, and then we wait again uh, for the contention window. Then we finally start transmitting. Once a frame begins transmitting, the first thing we get is the phi header, which includes that preamble that everyone else is going to use for their layer one CCA. So the length field in here um, is used for signal detect. After the phi header comes the MAC header. We move into the layer two portion of the transmission, and this is where uh, the duration field exists. So if we can demodulate the MAC header, now we can set our nav timer. Finally, after all this happens, we get to the MAC service data unit, which is simply the data payload in the frame. We went through this big complex process and added all this overhead to finally get to, geez, I, I mean, I've been talking for like 15 minutes, to finally get to transmitting the IP packet that we're trying to get from a station onto an ethernet network, for example. And it actually makes up a very small amount of, of the airtime that we're using. So after that, we've got a frame check sequence uh, used for air correction to make sure that uh, the, of the data integrity of this frame. We back off uh, for an inter-frame space. This is dead air. Um, and then the receiving station sends an acknowledgement back of course, there's no data payload there. It's just an acknowledgement that I received the frame. Back off again for an IFS, and then um, EDCA can start all over again, and perhaps another station can win the channel. So a huge amount of overhead here, necessary to account for the problems uh, that we discussed at the beginning here 
Uh, and this illustrates why it's so important to break up our collision domains and allow this process to happen in parallel uh, as much as possible. That's how we get the best net system performance uh, from our WLAN. So just to uh, kind of reinforce the point, if we look at this from a different perspective, um, first of all, we've got all this dead air where, where, no, where there are no Wi-Fi transmissions. If you see a channel utilization number and it's like 95 or 100%, it doesn't mean that your Wi-Fi network is uh, totally saturated. It's actually oversaturated. It means things are going wrong, and there's because there shouldn't be uh, Wi-Fi transmission 100% of the time. The protocol doesn't work that way. There have to be these periods of dead air where nobody's transmitting, and we're all sort of working out who's going to win the channel next. So when you see channel utilization, say, above 75 or 80 percent, that means you've probably got a lot of collisions or a source of interference or something's going wrong. Um, then one thing I want to point out here is the phi header is actually transmitted at uh, the lowest available data rates in the band. It doesn't matter how you've customized data rates on your controller or AP in terms of what you've enabled or disabled, made mandatory and supported. This is set in stone in the, in the standard. The PHY header uses different data rates. In 2.4 gigahertz, it's one or two megabits per second. In five gig, uh, gigahertz, rather, 2.4 gigahertz, and, and in five gigahertz, it's six megabits per second. And that uses more airtime. Using those slow data rates, takes longer. The MAC header and, and, and the MAC, the layer two portion of the frame is where we're finally using the, the fastest data rate that we can achieve uh, between the, the transmitter and receiver. And, um, you know, I mentioned this before, but the ACK has no data payload. So all of this is overhead just to get this IP packet uh, from a, a client to the access point or from the access point to the client. And this is not to scale, but um, if, if you look at this in scale, the MSDU, the, the data payload, actually is just a tiny sliver of time uh, in terms of transmission on the channel. And this all this other overhead takes up a lot of airtime. Um, so, what we've covered so far just shows how arbitration works in a 20 megahertz channel. But in 5 gigahertz and certainly in uh, the future in 6 gigahertz, wide channels are often used where we're using more than 20 megahertz. In 802.11 AC, we can go up to 160 megahertz, um, but often we don't go past 80. So we add even more overhead to use a wide channel of 80 megahertz. And, and this is an example of dynamic bandwidth operation that was introduced in 802.11ac. This isn't the only way to use a wide channel. Um, there, it's actually not mandatory that uh, DBO is supported or used, but some APs do use it. So imagine we have an AP using 80 megahertz uh, with channel 36 being the primary channel. Our CCA process looks a little different. We have to check each of the four sub channels individually um, uh, to make sure that we have, uh, they are clear. And they actually have separate thresholds for signal detect and energy detect. The way we do that is first we check the primary. That has to be uh, available for anything to be transmitted. Then we check the next uh, 20 megahertz, our secondary, and then we check the next 40 megahertz. So it's not all at the same time. Then we transmit uh, request to send 
on each channel simultaneously using um, the non-HT duplicate uh, frame format. And the receiver um, sends us back clear to send frames, TTS frames on the subchannels that are actually available. So in this example, we'll say there were there was actually a collision on 44 and 48. So the receiver said actually just 40 and 36 are available. Um, so after that, we finally get to transmitting our data frame. Something to note here is it's only the MPDU, that uh, MAC protocol data unit that's using the widest available uh, part of the channel. The phi header is still just using the primary 20. And the acknowledgement that comes back from the receiver is just using the primary 20. So after we've gone through that, then contention can start all over again. So now we've added even more overhead. And I also want to point out too, as we're using, even though we're using a wider channel, we still have most of our traffic occurring in the primary 20 megahertz channel. The secondary channels only get used when a data frames payload is transmitted. Everything else happens in the primary. So it's not a very efficient use of the spectrum um, uh, to do this, right? If, if we have channels that are unused, we may as well use wide channels and put something out there. But uh, if, if, we, if we have um, overlapping wide channels, it's better just to shrink those channel widths down uh, because we don't want to interfere with all this overhead uh, that's required by EDCA uh, to get um, frames across the, the medium. Um, so let's talk about some of the design implications of this. You know, like I mentioned, it's so easy to design for coverage. You almost don't need a design. You just need a bunch of APs. But designing for performance means optimizing contention and making sure that uh, our, our contention process is very, very efficient. This is a graphic from Keith Parsons of uh, Wireless LAN Pros, and I really like it. This is his idea about um, you know taking all this and, and boiling it down to a concept of the RF that you want, the RF you don't want, and the RF you don't care about. So what we're talking about here is uh, a scenario where we have two access points operating on the same channel. Purple access point on the left and the green access point on the right, both on channel one. And the area that you want from the perspective of the purple AP is the area where we've got good SNR. Our signal strength is minus 67 uh, dBm and above. And this, the signal strength from that green AP, which, which could potentially trip our CCA signal detect threshold, is below the noise floor. In this example, we're assuming the noise floor is minus 85 dBm. The area we don't care about from the perspective of the purple AP is where its transmissions drop below the noise floor, minus 85. And so clients in those in that area um, are unaware of, of that uh, RF or those frames. The area we don't want is where our signal strength from, from both APs overlaps in an area where the both, both of the um, APs are above the noise floor. Anything in this area is going to be um, tripping our at least tripping our CCA thresholds because we're above the noise floor with enough signal to demodulate the preambles. It's also a bad area for a client to be in because the signal strength from the AP it's connected to is low and we're gonna have to start data rate shifting. So when you're doing your designs, you can think about this and look at the way APs overlap that are on the same channel and and actually do some really cool visualizations. This is also related to a concept called ghost frames, which I actually like. 
and and what we're talking about here is when those when a frame you know gets demodulated down near the noise floor you can hear the preamble that's what's going to trip the coach um, sorry the um, clear channel assessment but the mac portion of the frame is modulated at a much higher data rate that needs a lot more snr to demodulate so there's a good chance the receiver hears the preamble and then after that the mac part of the frame just looks like noise can't figure out what it is so if you were running a packet capture there um, packet captures just uh, don't capture the preambles those don't get passed up uh, from the radio to see so you wouldn't be aware of these uh, you know so-called ghost frames these preambles that are there that are tripping the clear channel assessment um, but otherwise are kind of invisible so don't be scared of ghost frames but be aware of them uh, so let's get even more concrete and look at uh, a real world example this is a um, example of two access points in a very large office environment several hundred feet away from each other and what i've done first is just turned on uh, the access point in the top right and you can see the the colored areas the yellow and green areas that's where we've got signal above neg 65 that's the area that we want but we also have this gray area kind of spidering out down the halls um, that's the area we don't want right that's the contention area where our signal strength is above the noise floor preambles are going to be demodulated but it's very low and we don't want clients to try to use it we'd rather have them you know roam to a different ap if this other access point is on the same channel and i turn it on now we've got this don't want area where these access points are overlapping even though their signal strength is very very low approaching that um, in this case neg 90 uh, noise floor and clients that begin to get towards the edge of these cells are going to experience contention from the other cells in this don't want area so now they're all you know they're all in the same collision domain and we really don't want to do that um, so you know how do we solve this well the obvious issue here is that these access points are in the hallways so the hallways is causing this wave guide effect where the rf just kind of spreads out down the hallway all the way across the building the better solution would be to you know follow best practices and move these access points into the rooms where the clients are so right away you can see that contention area that don't want area disappeared where we don't have overlapping cells anymore they don't overlap anywhere above the noise floor the other benefit here is the areas where the clients actually are have better signal strength when we had the ap's in the halls we had great signal strength in the halls the rooms weren't weren't as good ap's in the rooms and our our clients that are in the rooms are going to have a much better experience that's one of the reasons why it's usually a, a better idea to put your APs in, in, in rooms than in hallways. Um, and that's a rule of thumb. It's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a hard and fast rule. It doesn't mean you should never put an access point in the hall. But by having these cells, we've really uh, allowed for the creation of two separate collision domains and now parallel transmission and no co-channel interference between these uh, between these two access points so you know this kind of reinforces the importance of a very careful design process not just to ensure coverage but to really uh, take into account co-channel interference understanding how it affects our arbitration process and the more contention domains we create that creates more net system capacity. Wide channels means high throughput to one client, but uh, smaller channel widths allow 
the entire um, system to, system to perform better, even though an individual client now has a little bit uh, more, you know, a, a, a limit on how fast it can go. And you know, uh, one other thing to consider about CCI, we, we mentioned the range of um, the signal detect threshold because of the way preambles are modulated. Is we've only discussed um, access point CCI, but clients transmit and they create interference with other cells as well, and they are mobile and in different spots. So think about the effect of client induced CCI as well. Well, um, you know, you may have heard of um, Wi Fi 6 and some of the ways it's changed. Uh, the arbitration process. We now have this really cool technology called OFDMA, where multiple stations can transmit and multiple stations can receive at the same time. Uh, the important point is that this happens within the context of the EDCA process we just described. So for OFDMA to happen, um, the access point has to go all the way through the EDCA process, win channel access, and then declare that now we're going to do OFDMA. So we're not replacing EDCA, we're kind of adding a new capability that happens within it. There are also some new capabilities, uh, which we did a blog on at sevensignal.com about uh, spatial reuse and the possibility to alter the signal detect threshold. Um, and actually now we're operating with two nav timers instead of just one. Uh, so we're adding a lot of complexity to this, but a lot of the old stuff um, is, is still just as important as it was uh, in its day. And don't say that OFDMA is like a switch or switch-like. We still have a half duplex medium. Uh, we still have a single collision domain. What we're doing is we're just kind of centrally coordinating access to it, more like what an air traffic controller does. I think that's a better analogy. Um, okay, uh, with that, Kelsey, maybe we have uh, a minute or two for some questions. Awesome, thank you, Jim. Um, I see a few of you have dropped some questions in here. We'll start off first with this comment that we got. Um, Ryan wants to know, what is the best podcast Jim has ever been on and why? <laughs> oh, well, it's Keith Parsons, uh, WM Pro. No, Ryan uh, <laughs> wants me to give a plug to the wireless podcast, which I will happily do. Uh, very entertaining, not for children, uh, but uh, it's a good one. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Okay. Uh, I'll hit on one or two questions here. We had a question from Chris earlier on that said, is hearing the preamble, does that mean that the preamble can be successfully decoded? Otherwise, yeah. it's just considered noise source. Yeah, that's what I mean when I say hearing the preamble. Uh, it's successfully demodulated and the, and the receiving station can um, uh, tell what the uh, frame or what the fields in the preamble are, are right? Awesome. Otherwise, it is just noise. All right. We have a question here from David, and he wants to know, do we have to have 802.11ac enabled to use channel bonding? You do not. So uh, channel bonding only requires 802.11n. And um, in 802.11n, you can go up to 40 megahertz channel width. Uh, but to go up to 80 or 160, yes, you do require 802.11ac. All right, I think we have time for one last question here, Jim. We have a question from Nikita, and they'd like to know, does EDCA and 802.11ax work on the whole channel of RUs? I think I probably didn't pronounce that right, but if you know what, I'm, what I mean here. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. So Nikita, that's an excellent question because one of the capabilities of OFDMA is subdividing that 20 megahertz channels channel into resource units where the subcarriers are actually allocated to individual stations. So that was actually a question I had. If we're doing that, can we kind of intelligently work around, you know, narrow band interference within the 20 megahertz channel? 
And the answer is no, because we're still using the same EDCA um, uh, protocol from before, and we check the availability of the whole 20 megahertz channel before we then move into uh, uh, OFDMA. So we, we check the 20 megahertz channel and decide as a whole, is it available or uh, is it idle or busy? If it's idle, then we can start uh, OFDMA. If, if it's uh, busy, we don't use it at all. So. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I think, Jim, that that is all that we have time for today. Uh, thank you to everyone for dropping your questions in there. We love hearing from you every week. And a huge thank you to Jim for going through this topic. Um, really interesting topic. A lot of great feedback from the audience. And a final thank you to all of you for joining us today and giving us 45 or 49 minutes out of your workday. So we hope to see you next week. And thanks, everyone. Bye, Jim. Thanks, everybody.